Up to now, all proof-of-stake based cryptocurrencies and blockchain solutions have been constructed in a heuristic way without proper security analysis, definitions and proofs. So you basically don't have a proper guarantee that your proof-of-stake based system is going to actually be secure in the real world as opposed to proof-of-work based schemes that have been analyzed and proven and secure. So what we have been aiming to do is to pave the way for the study of proof-of-stake based consensus protocols under a more formal framework of provable security and cryptography through which we aim at guaranteeing users that the protocols we are rolling out are actually secure according to a reasonable definition of security. In order to do that, we had to overcome several challenges, starting by how you even define security for this kind of scheme, and then how to actually build schemes that match these security definitions. So right now, we have our paper out on ePrint. Uh, it's been circulated around for peer review, and it basically implements such a protocol that we managed to prove secure according to this framework of provable security and the security definitions that we have put forward. Uh, of course, there's still challenges to be overcome, such as improving efficiency and scalability, but that's all part of research. We've laid the first stone in this foundation, so that's already pretty interesting. It's, as far as we know, the first provably secure proof-of-stake-based consensus protocol, and our security definition captures all the attacks that have been proposed against previous uh, solutions that didn't come equipped with proper security analysis and maybe even uh, thwarts even different attacks that people might come up with. So we're pretty happy about the security level that we can achieve. So most Cryptocurrencies are based on this proof-of-work mechanism that basically requires you to compute millions, billions, trillions of hashes per second if you want to generate a block for the blockchain to grow and for the system to work. This represents a huge waste of computational power and electric energy, which we know to be a very scarce resource, and uh, especially these days when we have the environment uh, threatened by all the CO2 emissions and uh, a, a shift towards green energy, we would like not to waste all this computational power or maybe actually use this for something actually interesting and applicable to, uh, to real world problems such as sequencing genes for finding cures to diseases or doing simulations to predict tsunamis and earthquakes and stuff like that. So with proof of stake, we, we don't need to do this scarce resource depletion proofs anymore. We just base the system into the assumption that the people who have a lot of money invested in the system actually want to keep that system working. They want to keep it functioning. Otherwise, their money that has been invested in the system will lose value because a system that is not trustworthy or that doesn't function properly will not be used by many people. People will sell their coins from that system and that will lose value. So the people who have a lot of money invested in that, they want to keep their money actually valuable. So they have a clear incentive to behave honestly and play the protocol to keep the system working. So that's what we base the security on, not on the fact that somebody is willing to waste thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in energy and equipment to keep the system working. So right now we have the main backbone of the protocol all laid out and the main characteristics that we wanted to achieve for that protocol have already been achieved. Our next steps are actually addressing more real-world issues such as scalability and efficiency when you have 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of users in the system as it happens with most cryptocurrencies. And of course, we also want to address other issues such as making it compatible with mechanisms such as side chains and uh, achieving better efficiency through implementations and actual protocol modifications that could benefit from better data structures or from better underlying protocols and primitives. So that's a clear future works direction into bringing the protocol as close to real world as possible. Even though we have something that already works, we want to make it as, as efficient as possible. And we're very confident that we're going to be doing this in the near future. So one of the main attacks against proof of stake based systems is the so-called nothing at stake attack that is basically that basically arises from the fact that you don't have to deplete a scarce resource in order to generate a block in proof of stake based systems usually in proof of work based schemes you have to compute the thousands of hashes in order to generate a valid block in the blockchain so if you want to generate several alternative versions of history you would have to compute much more proofs of work by computing so many more hashes but your resources are finite so you can't possibly do that unless you invest a lot of money in that also you can't just follow different forks of the blockchain because you simply don't have enough resources to compute all the proofs of work that would take for you to extend different forks again because your resources are scarce now, when you remove the issue of scarce resources, which is what we do, what we want to do with proof of stake, you open up to this issue where entities might try to extend several different forks of the blockchain or try to generate fake versions of history without actually needing to spend resources, which actually gives them an incentive to be mining let's say we don't even do mining per se in uh, proof of stake based systems but let's say to be extending the blockchain in different directions in conflict in conflicting directions because they might get a better financial outcome from always being guaranteed to always be on the winning fork now this has been a problem with previous heuristic schemes that didn't consider there's uh, the, the proper function for selecting who gets to generate a block in a proof of stake system. So how we solve it? We build our scheme in such a way that you can't just extend a block if you want to. You have to win a lottery and we prove that to win, to win that lottery, you, you can't really do any attack. You can't really influence the lottery it's as if you have a nice green leprechaun in the sky who tells you who won the lottery. And uh, by doing that, we are guaranteed that people can't just do this kind of attack where they try to extend different chains. Basically, because they can't just extend the chain that they wish to extend. They have to be selected for that first. And we show that everybody playing the protocol correctly ensures that people are selected randomly according to the proper distribution and that can, can be influenced as long as a majority of the stake is controlled by honest people and we can also easily see when somebody's trying to cheat on this protocol and influence the outcome of the lottery so that measures can be taken to punish these people if so wished by the players of the protocol and uh, the nice thing about our analysis with formal proofs and formal definitions is that we are guaranteed that the people generating these blocks selected through a proof of stake are selected by everybody in the protocol in such a way that we are 100% sure that unless they can let's say break RSA encryption or something similar, they wouldn't be able in whatever way to influence the final outcome. Thus thwarting 
there's nothing at stake attacks. So since we are doing, taking this first step into analyzing this kind of protocol formally, we start with an uh, assumption that the network is synchronous, meaning that we have a sequence of rounds that we call actually slots, inside which all messages are guaranteed to be delivered, even though the adversary may tamper with them in any way he wants. The only assumption that we have is that, let's say, if a slot lasts 20 seconds, the messages sent by parties participating in the protocol are delivered in these 20 seconds and not arbitrarily delayed for, let's say, 10 years. So this is a first step, a natural step even, in analyzing this kind of cryptographic protocol, since it allows us to have more compact and clear proofs and to understand the pro and to begin to understand the problems and pitfalls in constructing and proving this protocol secure. Uh, obvious next step, also in our line of future works, is relaxing the synchrony assumption to a different scenario where the adversary can actually delay the message for a very long time that is not known by the users in such a way that the user knows that the message is going to be delivered eventually, but he doesn't know if it's going to be delivered in 20 seconds, one minute or one hour, while still maintaining the same security guarantees. Now, you might think that the synchrony assumption is a completely bad and real thing, but we can, with current internet and current technology, we can actually get pretty tight clock synchronization that can be used to keep track of the round synchrony in a very re uh, reasonable way with reasonable security guarantees. If you look around uh, the information security community, they're proposing new cryptographically secure protocols for clock synchronization and so on that can be used to, the, to that end. So for a first step uh, towards probably secure POS protocols, I believe it's a reasonable assumption. Well, the POS, in POS scenarios, people get selected randomly to generate a block according to how much stake they own in the system. That means that maybe if you want only a handful of coins, you're going to be selected in the space of a year, but you don't really want to keep your computer on for the whole year, just waiting for that one 20 seconds slot when you're selected. So what, what can you do in that case? First, you want to make money by generating your block, and also you want the system to work. You don't want blocks not to be generated because people are offline. So what can you do? You can delegate the right to generate a block when, you're, when you are selected by the protocol to a third party which might be somebody who already owns stake in the, in the system or a complete uh, third party a company that has a delegation service, let's say. That is very positive because it allows people who have small amounts of stake to still make some money when they get selected for participating in the protocol and uh, it, allows for, it allows for us to tame the scalability issue because then you can, you can just define thresholds for participating in the protocol can actually say you can only participate if you have X percent of the total stake in the system, does reducing the number, the total number of people who are actually actively using the protocol, and it, it allows for better uh, reliability guarantees for the whole system because you know that delegates who have a lot, of, who have who control a lot of delegated stake, will want to keep their systems online. 24-7 uh, with good reliability because they also make money by playing that role of delegate. So that guarantees both that everybody's happy even by making some money even though they don't have much stake and without having to waste a lot of money and energy with their computers and so on and that the system runs smoothly. So that's a nice mechanism it will certainly be improved in the future, can probably get better guarantees and better distribution of funds between people and delegates and so on. 
but that's certainly a positive characteristic of the protocol. So when cryptography started thousands of years ago, people would usually come up with an idea, a way of encoding information, of encrypted information such that other people couldn't read that. They would do that, they would pass it around among some friends. Nobody could, if nobody could break it, they would be happy about it and go on using the, this, this idea until somebody managed to break it. It happened until very recently. You could even mention in the Second World War when you had the German Enigma machine that they believed to be very secure and it indeed was for the time, for the time of history until somebody managed to break it. So with these systems, you have no idea of what exact security guarantee you have until somebody finds out a completely unforeseen attack and breaks your, your whole idea into pieces beyond any hope of repair. So what started in the late 70s and has, has evolved into modern cryptography is what we call provable security, which is the practice of proving that a given cryptographic system, be it a cipher, a signature, or, or more complex protocol, is secure and remains secure as long as a certain set of assumptions remain true. So what assumptions are those? Apart from system assumptions, such as the synchronicity that I've just talked about, and uh, assumptions as to the power of the adversary of, on corrupting people, let's say the adversary only corrupts a minority of people, or only a third of people, of all the people in the protocol. And also, very importantly, the assumption that we cannot solve certain computational problems securely. For example, factoring large integers, which is the basis of RSA encryption that is in everyone's cell phone, um, computers, even smart cards these days. So basically what we aim at well, by using provable security is to lay our security guarantees onto solid foundations of problems that have been long studied by mathematicians and, and, other, and other people in the scientific community and which are believed to hold, which are believed to be hard to solve. So by doing that, we are not simply waving hands and saying we believe the system is secure. We are saying we believe the system is secure because after a hundred years of research into solving this specific problem, nobody came up with a solution to this specific problem. So we, we find it reasonable to assume that it's going to take a while to solve it. It's not like simply saying, I just had this idea out of my head to build a system, a crypto, a crypto system, and I believe that, that it's secure. How could you say that when you've been the only person to think of that specific problem? We have much better guarantees when we rely on problems that have been widely studied by the community.